So uh, very quickly, I was actually going to speak more about writing, uh, about being uh, writing both novels and both fiction and non-fiction, and the purpose of having unfinished manuscripts. Uh, but unfortunately, Harsha's steamrolled us into a different direction. So I'll also tell you a little bit about what pays my bills, which is that I work as a South Asia editor of a news website called The Third Pole. Mm. Now, uh, some apparently already know about it, but uh, the name of The Third Pole comes from the fact that the largest amount of glaciers in the world, after the North Pole and South Pole, are in the Himalayan region. And there are three big river basins the Indus, the, Ga the Ganga, and the Brahmaputra, which all link back to it in some form or the other. Beyond that, it also feeds in, you know, to the larger uh, Chinese Lama. So you've got about one and a half billion people dependent on these river basins. Uh, many of them uh, are related to agriculture. And uh, the tagline of the third poll is understanding Asia's water crisis. And uh, so I'd suggest you look at our website. I'd ask Harsh if he wants to write about his farm for our website. Um, we have a very specialist audience, but uh, we also have reporters based in Karachi, in Dhaka, and uh, Kathmandu. And for a little while, we also had uh, based in uh, Yangon. So we covered uh, people from. And these are people who are permanently there. We also get reporting from places like uh, Bhutan quite a lot. Uh, but uh, and you know when I went to Kabul, uh, reported from Kabul about because it's also part of the Indus uh, basin. The Kabul River is part of the Indus. Um, loops in and out of Pakistan, Afghanistan, and back into Pakistan, and all sorts of good, good politics are this that, 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 that river. Um, so. Uh, I'll talk just a couple of things about that and then shift to writing because it's interesting. Uh, to make uh, Harsh's point a little more difficult, in 2011, according to our census, we had about 380 million people in India uh, based in urban areas. In the next 15 years, this is supposed to increase by more than 220 million or something like that. This is the largest rural to urban change in the world. And a lot of it isn't necessarily that uh, people are going from rural areas to urban areas, but that rural areas are becoming urban. And this is one of the key links where a lot of the problems actually exist. Uh, because how does a city expand? And for those who are design people, you'll know this. It expands because there's no bloody plan. And it expands over the next area. This is cheap, I'll buy it. I'll fill over this area, I'll build. So what it happens is, it's a spill of concrete. And with that spill of concrete, what you lose primarily are your wetlands. And what your wetlands are, are your balancing areas for the city's temperature, because they keep you a little cooler when it's hot, and they keep you a little warmer when it's when it's cold. It is your regulation for your water, because if there's floods, the wetlands fill up. It's your recharger for your aquifers, because those are where the water trickles down. But these are exactly what is lost when a city expands. And every city in India is expanding exactly like this. So we have a rollaway crisis. And that rollaway crisis is something that nobody is planning for. Because that decision making is really at the municipal level. And municipal level powers, uh, municipal level people have no powers. So you have a municipal corporation election that just happened in Delhi. As cities expand, as India concretizes. This is that rollover disaster that's happening. And it's happening everywhere. Wonderful. Okay, so um, 
the as I was saying, there's a running disaster of concretization that is happening with India in how we urbanize. And a lot of that also has to do with the politics of who controls land regulation, who controls where things are built, and who has a power in that relationship. Right? So, uh, for example, I think municipal corporation, uh, corporate corporators, you can double check on this, check what their salary is. And their salary is, I think, zero. So when you have people spending crores for an election, in which the salary is non-existent, where do you think that money is going to be made from, if not from land, which is your most expensive bit asset, and which is sold in various ways? Uh, there's a good book by Mihir Sharma called Restart. I hate the name, I hate the cover, but the content is very good, right? Uh, except on agriculture, I think. Uh, Mihir is a very urban guy, so he doesn't get agriculture in the same way. But nevertheless, one of the great things that he does is talk about how property, the way that property is priced and allocated in Bombay creates an urban crisis. Right? It's not a natural problem. Uh, one of the ways uh, that we look at it, and I'll give you a, a concrete example. I come from a, well, my dad's uh, family from a small town in eastern UP called Gorupur. And I have farmland there, so I know thing. I have far bigger problems than you know, And basically, we bleed money. We just give money and think. It's farmland my mother manages. And that's OK. I mean, it's something that she has managed. Uh, and she's an incredibly capable person. So uh, she manages it, but it's a loss-making enterprise because there is no way to make money from uh, the way that things are structured. Uh, but Gorakhpur, in the last 30 years, it's water, it had 110 water bodies. Those have been reduced to about 35. That's how a small city grows. It grows by eating its water bodies. It doesn't have to. You can build around it. You can, if you have a good, ideal urban planning, what you can do is build in areas that incorporates the water bodies within itself. Right? I mean, if you look at Delhi, Delhi is a terrible urban design. It didn't used to be. It was built on hillocks in marshy land. So you see all the great buildings of Delhi, the old ones, are all on solid areas. But this is a Yamna riverbank, right? Around those rocky areas, where? Soggy areas. They have now all been filled in. Along the Yamna uh, uh, river uh, bank, this whole area, what you have is an earthquake disaster waiting to happen. Mm -hmm. Because it is very bad sandy soil. And there's uh, a, there, on this type of soil, what you have the danger of is something called liquefaction. Right? So if you've got a very, if you've got a strong earthquake, six or seven with an epicenter somewhere around here, six to seven is a huge range. So let's say it's 6.5 to uh, and above. You have the danger of the uh, soil behaving like uh, a semi-liquid. It doesn't matter what kind of building you build on. It will be wiped out. It doesn't matter. But a third of Delhi is built on such soil. Why? Because this is, you put quick profits in the way of maximum utility. The area where one must focus to do this is neither in the urban then nor in the rural. It is that bridge area which we call the peri-urban. Now that peri-urban area is a link between the, uh, your built environment and your much more rural environment, which is also built in its own way, but uh, it's not as, it's not concrete. Shop <laughs> <laughs> uh, There's a lot, actually in a sense that's true. There, there are a lot of villages in Delhi which are exactly this. And you need, uh, you need the peri-urban areas because that's where the farmer 
interacts with the earth. That's because you can't go to the farm. You've been planning for five years, you haven't gone to Harsh's farm. Okay. So what you need is a connection. Right? You need a place where it does not cost the farmer the bloody earth to come to you. Because he doesn't have the time. She doesn't have the time. Doesn't it requires money, it requires expense to get there. You don't have the time. So but because these very urban areas don't exist as marketplaces, this is where the heart, this is where the heart, that is what our cultural space was, was the heart in the very urban area. Because these don't exist, what you have are corporations making the link. And they charge you for that. And they add a little more. But basically, they are making profit of bad design. Bad design is right now our number one significant problem when it comes to urban rural transformation. And it will continue to be so because the people who are in charge of that design or who have technically the power don't have actual political power. Why do big cities like Bombay suck? Because the person who has the power is the person who is the state head, the chief minister. It is not the mayor. Does anybody even know the mayor of Bombay? Who cares? Because the mayor has no power. And if the person in charge of the city, in charge of that city, has no power, has no resources, has limited amount of trained equip people to do their thing, how do you think you're going to get design? You won't. Because even if the person is perfectly honest, they just do not have the time and resources to allocate police or thing properly. So if you want to see where the huge, the huge challenge is, this is here. So and it's part of something that third poll covers. Third poll's a little more on Know, transboundary water issues on, urban, on how this urbanization is happening, uh, China's uh, expansion into you know, Central Asia, so CPEC and all of that. Uh, but you're welcome to drop in, see what we do with that. Uh, so that's was not meant to be part of my presentation. That's, uh, let me close that chapter and talk about books. Right? And this is in a sense a transition, in a sense not. Uh, my last book was a political history of Bhutan in the Eastern Himalayan region. Okay. Uh, and uh, partially this comes from the fact that I'm interested in India-China. Uh, I worked uh, with an organization that was uh, working with the Tibetan exile parliament for about five, six years. So uh, looking at their transition for democracy, supporting that. But a lot of that meant looking at you know the China and Tibet and then India's uh, border. And uh, you guys know that the largest border dispute in the world is between India and China, right? Mm -hmm. yeah, about 4,200 kilometers of unresolved border. And the country that sits at the center of that is Bhutan, mm -hmm. with a population of about 700,000. Uh, if you've been following the news, we have a face-off with the Chinese troops. And what you will not find in the news is nobody knows exactly what is happening. Because by its very nature, the way that both... Because uh, Bhutan also has an unresolved border with China. By its very nature, the way that we have tried to resolve this dispute is by saying that nobody really believes the other person's maps or agrees to their interpretation. But what we will do is back off from both sides and leave a kind of, yeah, this area, okay, it's ours, but we we'll, won't push it uh, on both sides. This is, because it's the Himalayan region is as it is, it is incredibly uh, underpopulated. So Ha, the uh, district next to, uh, in Bhutan, next to which this face-off is taking place, has a population density of less than one person per square mile. Right? 
Now, in such areas, the idea of a border is very complicated because nobody went around and drew a bloody line. And the people who used these borders were tra traditionally shepherds and people like that who, for whom really borders are, yeah. Yeah. what the hell? That's right. an interesting in these, yeah. these incredibly new ideas, nothing which is. So uh, when, we, when we see these confrontations happening, nations present it as, OK, this is the line, this is the boundary. This is where the conflict is. Honestly, it isn't that clear. In different areas, different ways, either countries try to cooperate with this, or they try to bully each other. So there is there is a way of annoying each other when it comes to that. Primarily China has, maybe I'm also biased because I'm an Indian, uh, China has been doing this, but it also has the upper hand because of the geographical terrain. And because it has built more, uh, that is drier area, we're more in the tropical area, so it's harder to, for us to build a thing. They have had more money, so uh, there are a lot of other aspects when it comes to it. Also for, um, for uh, uh, China, that area is incredibly sensitive because this is Tibet. Right? Um, so huge amount of resources have gone in to try to make this, uh, to pacify this area. But border states across, across all post-colonial countries are where the conflict is. It is, that is how complicated it is. And it's probably most spoken language is Nepali which is relatively a new language, but it's also the language of trade, you know, and the lingua uh, trade, which is uh, basically Bhutan is seven mountain valleys, right, north to south. So if you live in a mountain valley, you don't go up the mountain to trade to the guy next in the next valley. What you do is you go down, and where there's a flat land, that's where you exchange goods, because it's simpler, and it, you also don't die, which is useful not to do when you're trading. Um, so, uh, but those areas used to be called the Duars, right? And they're still called the Duars. They're now in our territory, the Assam and Bengali Duars. Uh, they were uh, annexed by the British in uh, the 1856 uh, Duar, no, 1856, that would be just us. 1864 uh, Duar Wars with the Bhutanese, and which, have, which actually had a lot more to do with tea and opium, the, uh, the tea trade with Britain and, uh, and if you're interested in this, I wrote a chapter on this in my book, uh, which is called The Kingdom in the Center of the World. Up, uh, up to you if you're interested in that. Uh, but the, the doesn't cover it. Uh, basically because the linkages with tea are linked all the way up to the Boston Tea Party uh, and then the British, uh, you know, uh, the American independence war against the British. Okay, tea has its own connotations. Uh, you know the word teetotaler? Mm -hmm. What does it mean? It means a person doesn't drink alcohol. Why did teetotaling, why, why is the term tea in there? The term tea in there is because London was an incredibly disgusting industrial city. It had enormously polluted water. Why would you drink water? And in a very industrialized area, where you're working, where you have no worker, no labor rules or whatever, people are losing their limbs, what do you do to relax and to drink something which will not make you sick? You drink alcohol. So England had a huge alcohol problem. Tea became popular when the Dutch king, which is okay, so the the, uh, the you know glorious revolution happens in England, where a Dutch prince, William of Orange, becomes uh, is invited to become the king of England. His wife, who's from uh, who's from uh, Portugal, Spain, uh, brings tea along, which is incredibly expensive, and uh, about uh, you know about a hundred grams of tea would be the equivalent of. Uh, 
year's uh, salary of a normal laborer. Uh, and this is tea that is being traded and grown only in China. And that comes to uh, Portugal through, uh, through Macau. Uh, it becomes a high, high social cachet in England. The church decides it doesn't like, you know, the worker class drinking like crazy. So they push for something that will replace alcohol but which is boiled water and thus safe, and also has a social cachet, which is drink tea, right? That's where the word tea totaler comes from. The tea is so, uh, w there's uh, the capture of Sindh by the East India Company. Parshi was done because the treasure used from the capture of Sindh was to offset the opium burnt by the Chinese that the East India Company was pushing to, uh, to uh, China. The connections are, are because opium was sold to the Chinese by the British because they were bleeding silver to buy tea from China. And then uh, they tried to smuggle out crop and plant it. It didn't work. Then a tea committee was set up. And uh, they found out that uh, a local, actually Bengali landlord, told the British that uh, actually there's a particular tribe in Arunachal that grows crop like this. That is the tea, the black tea, the Assam tea, that then was then adopted by the tea committee and planted in an area. But there's only certain areas where you can plant that. So that's the Duar War. That's Darjeeling. That's why the wars with Burma. That's why the wars with Bhutan. That is why the capture of that particular space. That is also why that space has had enormous exploitation. And of course, one of the names that we get from the tea estate is Natsalbari. Because your uprising starts from an exploited area. So if you want to link the wars of tea, continue today. In, in this as a respect. Uh, because tea price was so high, that's why uh, the British tax tea in uh, the American uh, colonies, which led to the Boston Tea Party, which is where your ruling or American independence started. So you want to talk about tea, no. tea is a very complicated, what you're drinking is war, uh, right? Oh, incidentally, the Bengali uh, Zamindar who introduced tea to the British uh, was one of the people hanged after 1837 because he found that the British, the way they dealt with it, was incredibly exploitative and he took the side, uh, he rebelled against the thing. Um, so, tea, tea, tea. Uh, Bhutan does not plant any tea in its territory. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> they, they actually in 1864, that war, 1864-65, which is a trajectory uh, because the person who led that war from the Bhutanese side is the father of the first king. Very interesting guy, very bloody handed, uh, eliminated all rivals. They um, won that war in 64 65. They say they won. They didn't lose, which is itself a big deal. Huh, right? right? Uh, they captured uh, British cannons, which the yeah, British yeah. were completely, you know, like, what yes, the yes. fuck? These guys with bows and arrows have, uh, you know, and they. But uh, basically, the, it, it's a little more complicated because what the British did is they wanted the Duars. Uh, and to, they didn't want to invade Bhutan because mountain wars are extremely expensive. The uh, Anglo-Nepal uh, War, uh, the anglo uh, War, 1914-15, uh, was the most expensive war the British fought in history. And a lot of it was financed by uh, uh, stealing money from uh, and loans from uh, Awad, mm. uh, which then the British captured by saying, and said, you know, you deal with money very badly because you've lent so much to us for so many wars and we can't pay you back. Uh, so, <laughs> uh, that's the, the, the complexities and complexities of uh, imperialism are, yeah. is a lot of it is just about money. Um, yeah. But uh, for the British didn't want to have a long mountain campaign because capturing Bhutan would have required a huge amount of expense and time and thing. 
and capturing seven mountain valleys yeah, made no sense. And uh, it would also then abut them right next to China, which they weren't sure they wanted that border. Right? So there were, there were complexities to that. But the Bhutanese fought badly enough that the, uh, I'm badly named, well enough, uh, that the British were concerned that even if they captured the Dwars, these buggers would keep burning the tea plantations, at which point the cost of raising tea would, get, would escalate. So the British, in the only colonial thing of its kind, agreed to pay the Bhutanese rent for those for the Duarts at fifty thousand rupees annually, and uh, and then uh, they, it, it's a, it was a thing. but basically they bought peace from the Bhutanese, which is itself a triumph. I mean, yeah. this small, yeah. tiny country basically was able to extract rent from the British Empire, which had just, you know, devastated India in 1857-1898. So, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a big deal, that war. Uh, and it is to the Bhutanese their, uh, their point of emergence as a, as a, a, a mortar nation. Uh, and there was a consolidation, fulfilling of consolidation of the power of the father of the first king. Who was name, whose name was Jigmi Namgyal and was called uh, Dev Nabo, which basically means the black regent. So a uh, very interesting guy. Um, apparently, it's rumored that one of his advisors was a grandson of Ranjit Singh mm. and who was having revenge against the British. So there, there's all these things within the British documentation where they're saying, and there was this this dark Hindustani who is uh, who is instigating the the uh, the Bhutanese against us, but uh, the, the the mountains are rich with stories, and they're rich with complex stories that the plains do not hear, because we consider the mountains a periphery, and we consider them poor, we consider them the areas to be held under control. And that is, I mean, people, uh, the, uh, the Chinese talk about, uh, and the Tibetans is all about, you know, this these peaceful monks that, you know, got uh, you know, pushed under by the Chinese. You know, under, in the 8th century, the, the Tibetan, uh, uh, the Tibetan king at that point, uh, uh, his name uh, escapes in right now. Um, but he initially asked for the hand of the of one of the Chinese princesses uh, in marriage. The Tang Dynasty decided to show him some manners and sent uh, an army to discipline these red-faced barbarians uh, on the thing. And the Tibetan beat them. They they beat the Tang Dynasty, which is a very was one of the more powerful dynasties in uh, in Chinese history. Decimated that army. And the, and the princess was then married with honor, rather than having to ask. You know. So Song Sing Namto uh, was the name of the, uh, of the king at that point in time. So uh, the Tibetan Empire is its own, has its own complex history. It should not be reduced to you know, uh, just a couple of old men in orange robes. It is incredibly more complex. Uh, Bhutan's emergence as an independent nation came about by war against Tibet. Under with the Tibet uh, uh, under the fifth Dalai Lama and Bhutan under uh, uh, Groom, uh, what's his name? Uh, the Shabdrum basically is a title and Shabdrum basically uh, translates to the one at whose feet you submit right? so he is a founder of the 17th century Bhutanese uh, state the structure of Zongs uh, which is their Fortress, uh, but Zong in Tibetan basically means a place of strength. So it can also be a place where a monk meditates, right? So the Zong uh, complex is both a monastery as well as a fort, as well as the administrative unit. So this is uh, Caesar and Christ as one uh, unit, not as uh, a separate. Thing. Uh, the and that was the. Uh, Constitution uh, that uh, 
uh, Bhutan based its early uh, history on. The Tibetans had a similar thing. You know, the, the, in, in Kar, the fifth Dalai Lama was both, uh, both the administrative head as well as, as, the, uh, as a religious head. Uh, when uh, when the handover of political power uh, was consolidated in 2011, uh, uh, with the uh, current Dalai Lama handing over his political power, he said to us, "You know, uh, look, you don't have to believe that I'm the reincarnation, but I am the Dalai Lama. I can choose to do what the hell I want to do with my political power, and I believe that uh, before the fifth Dalai Lama, there was no political conflict." It's only the mixing of politics and religion that led to the religious role becoming our contentious role. And I wish to delink this, and this is my legacy. I don't care if you believe I'm reincarnation or not, but I'm the Dalai Lama, and I, re and I, I have re I would like to recover these powers. These are complex histories. You do not find them immediately. It takes a little while to find out. Um, but I guess the reason I told you these complex stories is because when you go searching for something, you don't know what you'll find. Mm -hmm. And if you accept the first story, you may not find out the second story, or the third story, or the fourth story. If you stop digging, you get very little. There is layer upon layer upon layer that you need, that you can disentangle. And, uh, and while I was uh, while I was researching my book on Bhutan, I started in, vaguely started in 2006, finally published in 2013. But in the middle of it, I thought, fuck it, I don't know enough. And every time I go, I learn that everything I'd learned last time was wrong, because there's this more complication. And by the middle of it, I was like, what the hell? How am I trying to tell the story of a whole country? This is such an ego trip. This is stupid. I should spend at least another 20 years, uh -huh. learn Zonka, read the documents myself, yeah. do the primary research, and then write a book. And then I thought, bloody hell, I'll never, I'll, it'll take too long. Yeah, yeah. So I wrote the book that I did as a provisional book. Saying, <laughs> And I guess partially what I wanted to say is that when you approach a project, when you approach a design, when it comes to something like books, it's important to realize your limitations. But it's also, and to understand that you can have a grand goal where you think you can maybe do a bigger, more complicated, full picture. You may not get there, but that goal will help you in little goals along the way. And I'll give you one more example and then we'll stop, which is that, have you guys ever read The Far Pavilions? Do you guys know? Because this is this, you know, uh, classic uh, British uh, empire yeah. novel, big fat one. Romance, uh, some rajas, and you know, 1857 and all of that. And uh, I read it as a kid, and I really liked it. You know, it's a big, you know, one of those things. Now, if I read back on it, I can see where issues are. But then, you know, I read this when I was 16, 17. And I thought, yeah, it's the only kitab likhna jayi. And I thought, but you know, the, the central character in the book is a British but who's been raised also as an Indian. So can it inhabit both worlds. And I thought, yeah, but it, I would like to write about an Indian guy who can inhabit the other world, right? So from Apni Tarasa. And I thought, yeah, this is, you know, this is the early 90s, right? So I thought I'd go, go about planning it and kind of research it and then and then I thought, you know, it would be really interesting to set it in the court of Zafar and that, that, that one of these guys on the sidelines who can inhabit both the British as well as them. I mean, I didn't know much about the court of Zafar. And that our histories really only focus primarily on the kings. 
the kings and their dealings. And the city you don't see. You don't see what the city is like for a common person. So I thought, okay, okay, then I started, how do you find out? Because common people are never documented. Right? Uh, unless today, in which everyone blogs about everything. Uh, so there, there is one set of common people that are relatively documented, because they document themselves, are poets. And they don't necessarily inhabit the court. So then I looked at people like Amir Khusro, uh, I looked at Jafar Zatali, uh, who's a great, I mean if you, Jafar is this guy who comes, appears from Punjab, no family history, nothing. He is Takhalos, Zatali, basically means you gali deta hai, right? Kya kya gali And he was assassinated apparently on the uh, orders of Farooq Siyad, the then emperor, the grandson of Amzir. Why again there are complex stories before and behind it, whether it was a Shia Sunni thing, whether it was because he insulted the mistresses of the emperor by saying that they they looked more like the backside of buffaloes than, than the bull. <laughs> he had a way with words. Uh, but the but yeah, interesting guy. These guys were operated out of the court in other areas. Uh, there's a, there's a, do you know why Chirag Dilli is called Chirag Dilli? Because of the same. Yeah. Because of the same. Chirag Dilli, who was the uh, successor mm -hmm. to Nizamuddin. Mm -hmm. So you know, this whole area about uh, these things that we and these are areas that are not not central. Level. No one talks about Chirag Dilli. Chirag Dilli is a nowhere space. Uh, so I started documenting these while I was thinking about writing this book. And in the meantime, that bugger Dalrymple ended up writing the Gonzo. I was like, I'm going to skip each other. Yeah, yeah. And then that was a problem. And then I was like, shit, I can't afford that type of research. And I don't want to be, I don't want to follow in somebody's path, right? So, uh, but then uh, I'd written this uh, novella called The Storyteller's Tale. And we were, uh, my editor and I were discussing it. And it was basically a man and a woman having a conversation of stories. The man tells a story, the woman replies with another, he replies with a uh, third, which, is a, which draws his story out of hers, and she concludes that set. Right? So it's a, it's a, uh, but uh, Ravi, my editor at that time, said, this is a great story, but it's only 15,000 words. You're going to need to bulk, bulk it up as a, uh, before we publish it. You can't publish 15,000 words as a, as a book. Uh, so I was like, okay, TK hai, kya gana? I was like, why don't you, you know, describe these people? You have not described, you're just, just a woman in a man. So I'm wandering Sufi, I hate the whole wandering Sufi uh, lines. I was like, okay, why don't we talk about Mir? Mm -hmm. Now Mir is this interesting guy who, uh, who's the only poet that Ghalib acknowledges was a master before him. Uh, and in fact, uh, when he, he was, uh, when Ghalib was a young, started out his poetry, somebody had his poetry, I think one of his uncles had presented to Mir, and Mir read it and said, Puri mehnat karega tu kuch ban sakta hai. You know, something along those lines. But he comes from Akbarabad, which is what, we, uh, was what uh, then Agra was called because Akbar had established his capital there. And uh, he comes uh, at the time of Nadir Shah's, uh, just after Nadir Shah ravages the city. And, and he's a really proud guy, just doesn't, doesn't. And he leaves Delhi after Ahmad Shah Dali ravages it. And it was just in, in his castle. And But he's also a complicated guy, he doesn't, he doesn't cow down, he, but he maintains. And then he goes from Delhi to Lucknow, uh, because Awadh is then uh, <coughs> building up and so on. But keeps the, it's just, you know, people laugh at him in the first Mushaira he turns up because he's de dressed in Delhi fashion, which is very different from Awadh fashion. And he uh, recites this in Nazm, which is, what the fuck, you guys know about anything? Because I lived in that, right. that 
that place whose gardens the heavens have ravaged. What do you know of Delhi, of that Delhi? And uh, so I said, okay, why don't why don't I set this? Why don't I make the storyteller kind of mirror? And that's what I ended up doing and setting the historical context of storytellers still in 18th century Delhi and the wider environments of of Amisha Abdali's ravaging of, of uh, the, the destruction that wrought and the complicated nature of uh, the area then. But I tell you the story because I'm this book that I wanted to write in the 90s as a young kid who had read MMK and the part of Indians and said, yeah, I have to give a has never been written. Right? And maybe it will never be written. Maybe at some point of time I'll get around to it. Don't know. And like this, I have like five, six other you know manuscripts that are either half written or undone or projects that I have, but they lead to something nevertheless. Right? So uh, for me, the idea of the grand projects is incredibly important because those grand projects bear complex fruit along the way. Um, and I'm just gonna. Uh, you guys all know the Odyssey, right? Uh, of uh, Homer's Odyssey of Odysseus re returning from uh, from the uh, Trojan War. Uh, there's a uh, Egyptian. Uh, uh, there was an Egyptian boy, uh, Kavafi, and he has uh, he had this lovely poem called Ithaca, which is the hometown of Odysseus, who's returning back and is diverted by Poseidon, by the Cyclops, by everybody else. And uh, I just wanted to read it out to you. It's a very short poem. And it's, it. and it's called Ithaca. As you set out for Ithaca, hope the voyage is a long one, full of adventure, full of discovery. I don't know how one pronounces it. Lastragonians and Cyclops, angry, angry Poseidon, do not be afraid of them. You'll never find things like that on your way as long as you keep your thoughts raised high, as long as, rare, as a rare excitement stirs your spirit and your body. Lastrogoinans and Cyclops, wild Poseidon, you won't encounter them unless you bring them along inside your soul, unless your soul sets them up in front of you. Hope the voyage is a long one. May there be many a summer morning when with what pleasure, what joy, you come into harbor seen for the first time. May you stop at Phoenician trading station to buy fine things, mother of pearl and coral, amber and ebony, sensual perfume of every kind, as many sensual perfumes as you can. And may you visit many Egyptian cities and gather stores of knowledge from their scholars. Keep Ithaca always in mind. Arriving there is what you are destined for. But do not hurry the journey at all. Better if it lasts for years. So you are old by the time you reach the island, wealthy with all you have gained on the way, not expecting Ithaca to make you rich. Ithaca gave you the marvelous journey. Without her, you would not have set out. She has nothing left to give you now. And if you find her poor, Ithaca won't have fooled you. Wise as you will have become, so full of experience, you will have understood that by them what these Ithikas mean. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, okay. Very nice. Yeah.